Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Dan Monzani, Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora Energy Research. This episode of Energy Unplugged is a deep dive into what is a lively debate in the GB power market at the moment, uh, but also one that will resonate across many of the markets uh, we operate in as we build net zero power systems. That is the importance of networks, both to investment decisions and to the operation of the system. Uh, This is a topic we've discussed before on the podcast. So in July, we interviewed Julian Leslie, the chief engineer and head of networks at the electricity system operator. He was talking about the steps they're taking to speed up the huge backlog, now over 300 gigawatts of connection requests in Great Britain. Uh, And back in September, uh, I discussed the potential role for locational marginal pricing with a number of Aurora experts uh, in Germany, in Australia and in the United States. This is another topic we'll be coming back to in the autumn Uh, when we uh, present some of the findings of a major multi-client study we've been doing into LMP in Great Britain. However, it's a huge issue. We make no apology for digging further into it, uh, as this is uh, clearly something our clients raise with us and uh, an area that we know regulators are very interested in. So today's podcast is about how we expect networks and congestion to evolve in Britain and what that means for investment cases and the kinds of analysis that we're doing at the moment to help our clients get an edge in a rapidly changing world. I'm joined today by two of our leading internal experts on this. Ashutosh Padelka leads our renewables research in GB. Welcome, Ash. Thank you for having me, Dan. And Alex Houston is a senior associate in our GB advisory team, where she's led a variety of work relating to networks for all sorts of asset developers. uh, And we'll be hearing more about that shortly. Good to have you on the podcast, Alex. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Dan. Great. Well, let's kick off. Um, Ash, uh, you've led a group meeting on this for our clients uh, recently. Why is this so important? 24 months or so ago, it was really only a few of us deep energy nerds who cared about networks. Now you can barely read a newspaper report without networks featuring prominently. What's changed? So we we need to look at the installed renewable capacity in the system. So looking back at 2012, about 10 years ago, the renewables capacity in the system was about 14 gigawatts. In 2022, this figure is nearly 40 gigawatts. Now, this is by all means a huge success story and something to be celebrated, but the growth in renewable capacity has slowly chipped away at the headroom that is available in the grid. So in 2016, the turn down that is being, uh, that is the system operator telling wind generators to stop producing from their, their assets was about one terawatt hour. This is in 2016. This has grown to 3.5 terawatt hours in 2022 last year. The cost associated with this has increased fivefold over this period to two billion pounds last year. That's 37 pounds per household in 2022 just to manage congestion or instability in the system. On the worst 10% of the days last year, that is worst in terms of congestion, we were curtailing or turning down 8% of all generation. This issue has grown significantly due to the decreasing headroom in the system. Okay, well, so uh, costs like that are obviously a big issue for consumers and regulators. I can see that. But Alex, um, what types of investors uh, uh, care about this? Um, After all, um, one of the reasons for the cost is obviously that um, some of these um, companies are being paid for the the curtailment. Yeah, absolutely. And they are being paid, but that is probably to varying degrees, right? So realistically, until now, um, a lot of the work that we've done has been focusing on the wholesale markets and forecasting the potential wholesale market revenues for investors that they can get in that space. But as Ash was just saying, if networks are going to continue to become constrained, more and more constrained over time, um, this is going to increase the size potentially of the balancing market and the balancing market system actions. And therefore, investors and portfolio managers and uh, asset operators are going to become increasingly dependent on balancing market revenues. 
And understanding the wholesale market, that's one thing. It's a very, it's a very deep market. It's a national market. It's fairly transparent. Uh, it's quite, it, it, it's relatively easy to understand when you compare it to, on the other hand, the balancing mechanism, which is a lot more opaque and a lot harder to actually, uh, for, for us to understand and to know also what bids and offers are actually even getting accepted and what sort of bidding strategies investors need to actually be putting in. So that is really where a lot of the interest is coming from. And it's that increasing dependence, increasing dependence on on the BM. And I think there's another side of it, which is also that, uh, so under the BM, the current rules are such that assets are actually expected to bid in around cost or maybe something like 5% over cost or something around that. And if you have a subsidized asset, such as an offshore wind asset with a CFD, their opportunity cost, if they're having to turn down uh, their generation, is going to be their strike price. And therefore, they're able to bid in at their strike price and get a sort of equivalent revenue and therefore not be loss making potentially at that time. However, when an asset is merchant, either during the merchant tail of the project or also, you know, we're seeing some res assets which are just choosing to, to gain merchant exposure, um, their actual cost is going to be a lot lower. So what they're allowed to be bid in currently in the BM rules is going to be a lot lower. And uh, th- therefore, that will change the bidding strategy uh, into not just the BM, but also the the CFD and the CFD auctions, and it has impacts both on both on the cost of the networks and also uh, and the cost consumers and also um, the cost for investors. Very good. Okay, so we'll dig into some of the case studies of how people have been uh, trying to understand this greater complexity and, and work with us to to get a handle on that uh, in order to either sort of. Um, manage the risks or to um, take advantage of the opportunities in this system. But before we do that, Ash, just um, just just let's project forward a little bit. We've already gone from, what did you say, a terawatt hour to three and a half terawatt hours in six years. What's the outlook? Is this going to get much worse? Absolutely. So National Grid has a 10-year statement called the Electricity 10-Year Statement or ETIS. Even if all of the transmission upgrades in ETIS are delivered on schedule, the transmission capacity at the boundary between Scotland and England will reach 12 gigawatts in 2030 from 7 gigawatts in 2023, while the wind capacity connecting in Scotland will reach 25 gigawatts from 11 gigawatts now. So there's this clear mismatch between the wind capacity and the capacity that's carrying this power down to where the demand is. So to address this, Ofgem has selected 26 key lines, including some 2 gigawatt HVDC cables from Scotland, which go offshore and then connect back in England for a new framework that that aims to deliver transmission lines faster by reducing competitive tendering requirements and providing pre-construction funding. So this is called the Accelerated Strategic Transmission Investment Framework. Further, National Grid has proposed the holistic network design as a new design to connect offshore wind. Instead of connecting radially inwards, it proposes a top-down coordinated connection model where offshore wind connects closer to where the demand is. HND still doesn't include all of the capacity contracted in the, in the Scott Wind leasing round, and National Grid is already working on HND follow-up exercise as a means to connect the remainder of the capacity. Further, Desnes has recently released its response for the Offshore Transmission Networks Review Future Framework. This talks about considering grid connections during the seabed leasing phase, so much earlier on in the process than uh, where we currently do it. This will be helpful for new projects that get seabed leases in the future, but for the capacity that is already with seabed leases and potentially even CFDs, we still need to ensure that ASTI and HND are both delivered by 2030, by 2035, their optimal delivery dates. We'll discuss some of these challenges later, but the outlook is that these uh, these 3.5 terawatt hours and 2 billion pound figures are bound to get much worse before they improve. Yeah, it can be quite an alphabet soup, this um, this area, can't it, with all your H&Ds and your ASTs and what have you. But I think that the key point there is, you know, we're already constrained. Uh, the 10-year statement's talking about, uh, about, a, about a 
slightly more than 50% increase in capacity, whereas the wind's more than doubling over the same period. So um, really hard to even even keep up uh, with the explosion in, in wind in uh, north of that uh, B6 constraint between Scotland and England. Um, but of course, <laughs> that's a world where they will get delivered. Um, do we now believe that that's going to happen? Have, have the changes that actually I, we heard Jonathan Brearley on this podcast a few months ago, um, Keith Anderson also spoke about this, uh, quite a big movement on regulatory funding. Do we think that's sufficient to unlock the, the necessary um, deployment of, of networks? So the, the discussion around funding has gone from being, do we really need this or do we have a stranded asset in terms of, in terms of uh, transmission infrastructure to, yes, we need all of this and we need to clear funding for it to get it all built. So the funding discussion has transformed significantly in the last three to five years. The blueprint is now partly there. People have a plan for how to connect all of this offshore wind. They've got the HND, HND follow-up exercise. All of this is there. The challenges are supply chain and planning. The supply chain needed for raw materials, needed for network build, so the steel, copper, aluminum, all the really basic stuff, it needs to go by, grow by a factor of four to five times to meet the demand. This is at a time when the, not just the UK, but also other countries need to rapidly deploy significant amounts of network. So in the same period when the UK needs to build something like 10,000 kilometers of transmission network, France, Germany, and Spain need over 80,000 kilometers of network in the same period. So this is a significant challenge to scale up our supply chains. The other aspect is planning. It currently takes between five to 10 years to secure planning consent to build new lines. This is not including local opposition that can make things even worse. A key 112 mile line in East Anglia that was selected in ASTI, the, the, the accelerated delivery framework we, we discussed earlier, is facing opposition from six MPs, including the Environment Secretary. Yeah, okay, that's, that, that, that's, that's pretty chunky challenges then. So let's take those last two in turn. We've, you know, we talked about the funding, the blueprint. You know, it's quite a shift, actually, from incremental additions to the, the existing spine to a, a wholly new holistic network design, but, you know, still work to do to complete that. But talk me through what can be done about these two big challenges, supply chain uh, first and then planning. Yes, the supply chain needs to grow by a factor of four to five. If we can ensure that there is long-term contracts available to the industry, they will build in response to that. This is exactly the same as having long-term contracts for renewables or hydrogen. If we can provide 10, 15-year contracts uh, that are backed by the government, we can get the supply chains in place, but we need to do that now. We don't have the time to lose. We can't wait for another five years to get these things in place. For planning, this is the most challenging aspect. Large-scale planning reform will be unpopular, but this is absolutely necessary. The capacity that can be built as undersea cables is already being deployed as undersea HVDC lines. What, what they still need at the end of that HVDC line that's undersea is an onshore infrastructure. This is pylons. Planning reform is absolutely crucial in ensuring that decarbonization of the power sector can be delivered. Yeah, and your example of that 112-mile uh, line in East Anglia is a really good one, right? You can coordinate uh, the offshore development off East Anglia so that it has the minimum number of landing points, but you've still got to build substations and you've still got to build some big transmission cabling to get it from the coast to demand centres, right? Exactly, and currently this is the bit that's facing opposition, very staunch opposition. We need to change that. So I, I get the sense you don't think that there is... Um, adequate room for maneuver by sort of process improvements and so forth to make uh, what I think is sort of around 10 years to deploy network assets. You don't think there's a sort of leaning of processes. There's just some hard trade-offs, right, about um, about who can hold up projects. Is that is that the kind of thing that people are grappling with? Exactly. So currently, the, the, the view that the, the market takes is that, yes, people have talked about ASTI, people have talked about HND, but the realistic case scenario is still that we might not even be able to deliver ASTI. We might not have even be able to deliver the key lines that the government thinks are absolutely necessary. So what happens then? Yeah, brilliant. And that's a great segue into some of the more specific questions that we're being asked by our investors. So, um, Alex, perhaps you could just give us an example of a, a few of the different asset classes and the kinds of questions they ask um, to deal with the risk that the investment doesn't manage to deliver the network in time. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, that sounds like a, a fairly straightforward question, but realistically, Dan, that's a, quite a loaded question with quite a, quite a lot to unpack, really. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'd probably categorize this into sort of may, maybe two categories of, of assets that we can think about. We've got our, our flexible assets and, you know, flexible, that's both in terms of uh, their ability to um, switch on, switch off, but also uh, potentially locationally flexible. And, you know, we've got batteries, we've got some LDES, uh, potentially abated gas, but I'll also put maybe hydrogen production in there as well. And then we've got our res assets, which are a lot more, um, a lot less able to respond to uh, locational signals in the sense of uh, they're a lot more restricted on where they can site, right? So obviously an offshore wind developer is restricted in terms of the seabed leasing rounds and where they can actually place the assets and the where the best load factors are. Similarly, uh, a solar farm also will be seeking out optimal load factors, but also be constrained potentially by, by grid connections as well. So although theoretically you'd like them to be able to respond to locational signals, maybe they are, they are less able to. But I'll go back to the earlier assets that I mentioned and maybe start with talking a little bit about, about batteries and what we've been seeing from, from certain battery projects. There's probably two categories of opportunities coming our way when uh, we're getting requests with respect to batteries. One of them is with respect to optimized siting. So that really is sort of future proofing against uh, network build uncertainty, against net zero policy, and also market reforms. You mentioned right at the start of this uh, locational marginal pricing under the REMA consultation. And obviously, we've been doing a huge piece of work on that as well. And there's definitely some interest in understanding you know, how that could impact. And that, that's it's very strongly integrated with uh, network constraints, that, that system as well. Um, so that is part of the optimization of, of siting. And then there's the other side of it is uh, co-location. So really looking at co-location as a bit of a, a hedging strategy. I'd say most of the requests and most of the interest that we've been getting um, on batteries has been uh, considering uh, potentially how to make the most out of uh, cheap charging opportunities in northern regions. So like I was saying before, batteries are probably the most flexible asset that we can actually have on the grid, so they can really be moved anywhere. And therefore, looking at the opportunities for placing assets in northern regions, um, maybe sort of uh, around the B6 boundary, especially sort of looking at the very high levels of constraints that we're seeing across the B6 and where they can be placed in order to actually uh, potentially be able to benefit off BM system actions by sort of charging up quite cheaply um, and therefore also bringing down their, their short run uh, marginal cost in, in that sense. And we've had a few of these uh, and also co-located projects. So where these batteries are being co-located potentially with wind. So then when the wind has been curtailed, how much is actually available for the batteries to then charge up by? Of course, all of this within the constraints of potential CFD contracts and so on. Um, and we've been able to assess the value of the balancing mechanism uh, in these cases, so votes for a standalone and for co-located assets using our uh, asset dispatch tool, Kronos. But there's definitely a different side. There's an alternative approach, which is something that we're not seeing quite so much at the moment, but we think could potentially be an area that, uh, that battery developers are become more interested in, which is where instead of seeking to reduce their short run marginal costs through re reduced charging costs, actually looking to uh, to seek out higher BM offers for turning up generation when the system is tight. So looking at locations more in the south, potentially considering, for example, the SV1 boundary, which is a relatively constrained boundary when you consider quite how much demand you have down right down in the south offset with very low generation, mainly a lot of it coming you know, from interconnectors or potentially solar in the future. 
Um, and therefore, you know, bat- there's a strong role that batteries could actually play in in that in that region. And I would note that, you know, um, Ash mentioned before that the ETYS upgrades are being implemented, but there's no mention of SE1 upgrades also within ETYS. So even if you are allowing a lot of that wind generation to be coming down south, there's potential that actually southern boundaries then become become some of the stronger constraints that you see down the line. So that's really interesting. So we are seeing people looking at different levels of granularity depending on what they're doing. So you mentioned Kronos. That's our um, that's our, our internal tool, but it's also a piece of software that we license to a number of developers so that they can routinely look at where the best place to site their assets are, what the valuations are, and indeed, as you mentioned, uh, work out optimal co-location strategies. But you're also trying to dig a level deeper into some of the really granular locational um, challenges that are evolving and, and the different scenarios in which they might evolve. That, um, that SC1 example is a good one, right? You could you could change the outcomes quite considerably by looking at alternative scenarios in which um, that network was or wasn't upgraded, I, I presume, Alex. Is that, is that a material consideration? Yeah, I, I think it definitely is. I mean, I, I think under our baseline modeling, until now we've been focusing sort of on the B6 and B8 uh, boundaries as, you know, the main areas of congestion in GB. And definitely, historically, this has been the case. But I think there absolutely will be opportunities going forward to actually take into consideration the where that congestion is going to move. And that will very much depend on, like Ash was talking about just before, how the network build out is actually deployed, having sort of forecast on the different scenarios for deployment as well, and therefore where you are shifting that shifting that congestion around. And that will impact the hedging strategies that uh, operators such as like battery operators are going to be able to adopt in order to try to create a portfolio which is future proofed. Uh, across a wide range of scenarios. And I think that's really sort of where there's a fair bit of interest in at the moment. So it's an emerging dimension. You know, people have asked us for years about, you know, um, being resilient to different weather years and having different assets in their portfolio that manage that or different different profiles of revenues for their different assets. But now actually thinking about your locational footprint as well is becoming an area that starts, people are starting to ask questions about. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And... I'll also just um, continue on that a little bit because there's another dimension until now I've sort of mentioned a wholesale market. I've mentioned the BM as well. But the other emerging dimension, potentially for assets such as batteries, uh, that hasn't been explored that much until now maybe, um, is the participation in ancillary services such as frequency response and reactive power. This has been both batteries and LDES, but you know, batteries do seem to be participating a little bit more in these services now, um, and therefore actually understanding the value that could be driven from these services and how that could change over time depending on the different uh, network outcomes is also something that we could be looking at. Yeah, it's interesting. You're right. We did see some um, some some batteries in some of the uh, some of the Pathfinder auctions. Although, of course, um, they have to trade that off against some of the other of opportunities to um, earn money um, because they need to keep their their charge at a particular state. But I'm, I'm really interested in what you said about um, long duration storage. And obviously, there's some uh, both both large pumped hydro storage projects existing in Scotland, some big plans, and also some of the newer forms of assets. Um, why might they have a particular role and what kind of questions do we get asked about um, about those kind of assets uh, in a world of constrained networks? Yeah, they they certainly have a significant role to play. Obviously, you know, you mentioned the pump storage hydro. They have little flexibility or no flexibility when it comes to actual locational mobility, of mm-hmm. course. Um but they definitely can play a role in terms of providing services with respect to uh, locational constraints. Um, but the other one is probably the more emerging technologies where we have had requests with respect, with respect to maybe compressed air or liquid air storage uh, and looking at the opportunities for those types of technologies um, where you're sort of talking about maybe six hour plus storage. And 
the opportunities there is in the BM because you potentially have slightly better chances of uh, or of having a higher acceptance rate in the BM um, that maybe some batteries might not necessarily be able to be able to capture in the same way. Uh, where acceptance rate, rates will vary depending on the technology. So a, a six-hour plus storage asset uh, could benefit a little bit more from BM services. But they also are being able to provide um, a lot of other services, uh, such as that inertia services or reactive power. Um, and in some instances, they're able to do this in a, w- without actually emitting any watts onto the system, So, which is... Uh, provides a slightly new technology and the value of that, I think, is still something that that we are assessing. Great. Um, I, I just want to ask a couple more areas and then um, and then we'll, we'll move on to some of the other um, market-wide challenges. But I'm, I'm fascinated by how hydrogen, particularly sort of electrolyzers, the production of hydrogen might play in this space. And then we, we should talk a little bit about um, how renewables developers think about this and the questions they ask. So uh, tell me about how hydrogen might uh, interact with a constrained network and, and the extent to which people are starting to think about um, the locational aspects of, of those projects. Yeah, definitely. Um, if we're thinking about hydrogen production, I mean, currently uh, industry participants such as uh, electrolyzers aren't actually able to participate in the BM. But it's definitely worth considering a scenario, I think, where some BM reforms are evolving Uh, are allowing the BM to evolve so that maybe it is able to allow such participants to to step in from a more, you know, demand side response as well, Um, input into the system, relieving system constraints. So, for example, uh, an electrolyzer would be able to step in in, at a time of high wind generation, where instead of creating potential voltage issues on the system by uh, having to turn down wind and turning up CCGTs, you're instead able to actually relieve the system constraints a lot more by uh, turning up electrolyzers. And actually, this could also reduce the actual cost on the system as well. Um, and then there's a lot of interest as well in terms of co-location of electrolyzers. And this is very similar to what you see in terms of batteries. It is obviously very dependent on transport and storage networks. So those need to be that that does need to be built in order to allow co-location of electrolyzers. But similarly to co-locating with a battery, you've got a lot of cost savings um, by implementing a co-located asset. And you will save in terms of your your grid connection as well. Um, And so there's a lot of, of interest in that in terms of actually being able to sort of soak up all those extra uh, extra watts on the system in times where where uh, wind assets are being are being curtailed. And we've definitely had some requests actually come through in that space uh, where we're actually being asked to size how much curtailment we think is going to happen within certain zones and therefore how many hours of generation we think would be available to uh, a storage or a hydrogen a hydrogen asset, which is sort of well positioned to actually absorb absorb that excess electricity. It's a really interesting one to think about, isn't it? Because I mean, in the short run, we get asked those questions, as you say, and people are trying to sort of basically trying to weigh up if I'm going to build a electrolyzer, should I have it nice and close to the demand so that I can use it easily, or should I have it close to the the wind and managing some of these constraints? As you say. You, you know what you avoid on one network, you 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 hit on another network um, and that infrastructure there. Yeah, but it may very well be in the future there is a there is a, a more um, more available infrastructure for transporting hydrogen around um, in, both in the UK and and in Europe. So it'll be interesting to see how that market evolves and whether the strategies need to change um, as you look across the different networks that you can you can take advantage of, not just electricity. Um, yeah. Let's turn, let's turn to renewables then. So we talked a little bit about how um, there's a degree of protection through the CFD, but this is still something we we look at for our clients quite a lot uh, on their on their wind projects, right? Yeah, I think it's a uh, it's a pretty big one um, for for renewables. Like I mentioned earlier, and just sort of reiterate, you know, uh, an asset with a CFD is protected to a certain extent because of their strike price. 
Um, and therefore, if they're bidding into the BM, they're able to sort of bid in at their strike price or maybe around 5% plus, uh, plus. And the risk really comes in when you've got a merchant asset. And there are two sides to this because you can be bringing down the overall cost of the system um, by reducing the cost of the BM by having assets bidding in a lot lower. Um, however, you can also be increasing potentially the cost of capital that is required uh, for these projects earlier on and also potentially the actual strike price that they're bidding into the CFD auction earlier on because they need to make up these costs in the lifetime of their CFD rather than sort of depending on on future revenues coming through the merchant assets. So there's a sort of circularity I think in terms of how of how res assets will would would respond, especially when we're talking about offshore wind. And it's also worth noting, we all we we often think of offshore wind as being entirely covered by CFDs, but we'll have a lot of rocks rolling off in the next five years. So a lot of the sort of legacy subsidy schemes which are going to be rolling off. So a lot more assets which are reaching that merchant tail end of their project. So coming on as merchant. But we're also definitely seeing a trend in certain assets choosing to actually expose themselves to um, to merchant economics yeah. and to and to not necessarily take on a CFD for the full portfolio value that they actually have. We saw this in the Mori West um, project with Ocean Winds. A little while back, uh, that there was definitely I can't remember how much of the of the portfolio they chose to expose to merchant, but yeah, was, they. I think they said fifty percent plus. Actually, Alex, it was um, probably PPA wrapped rather than yes. completely floating. But um, yeah, yeah, very yeah, heavy. yeah. It was mostly PPA wrapped, uh, and there might have been some floating, I think, in there as well. Um, but yeah, and, and this is definitely a trend that we're seeing that we're seeing growing over time, right? So, um. It's really interesting, I think, for them to to see uh, to see how that works. And then there's also uh, even onshore wind. We had a request a little while back uh, in terms of looking at the actual sizing of uh, potential BM revenues for onshore wind and understanding bidding strategies as well, both in a CFD and post CFD period. So that is also something uh, that we've been seeing coming on a lot, a lot more. Yeah, really interesting, isn't it? And definitely an important part of choosing your own spot on the curve, on the risk return curve, is that blending of PPA versus um, versus CFDs, particularly such a, a tight administrative strike price. So that's been a really interesting bit. But of course, if you do that, you then got to think about the locational exposure it, it gives you. And we've been talking largely about transmission there, Alex. That's been a really great run through of a lot of the, the issues we, we, we're hearing from clients. Um, Ash, um, what about distribution connected assets? How does it differ there? Yeah, that's a really good point, Dan. So in the last three years, nearly six gigawatt of generation capacity in Southeast England and East Anglia that connects to the distribution network has been offered a non-firm connection. So a non-firm connection is where the distribution network operator says to you, hey, you've got a one gigawatt asset, but I'm only going to give you a connection for 800 megawatts for the, for the next three years. And then maybe once you've figured out some of the issues will then give you a full gigawatt. Another way in, in which a non-firm connection might work is time-based limitations where in certain hours of the day or certain times of the year, your, your connection drops to a much lower value than the full size. The final arrangement, which is now being taken up by more distribution network operators is active network management. So active network management is where the level of congestion on the network decides the level of curtailment for a non-firm connection. So a, a one of the models in which uh, active network management might operate is pro rata, where every single generator that has a, a non-firm connection is curtailed as, as the same fraction of their generation. Another uh, model that we've seen is last and first out, where the burden of curtailment is placed on the last generators to connect. The key difference from a transmission network is that a distribution connected asset does not receive compensation when they are curtailed. What can generators do to mitigate the impact of this kind of uncompensated curtailment? Well, collocation with storage could help shift the generation in time to avoid curtailment. We are exploring this in detail in our group meeting on non-firm grid connections on the 5th of September. So here we'll look at how uh, Kronos could, uh, could help 
generators manage this risk? That's great. That's really helpful. Yeah, it's an area we, we definitely we recognise there's a lot more appetite for greater granularity um, in both time and place. So we're we're doing a lot of work on this. Let, let's pull, pull it back up uh, to the full market level then. So clearly a lot of containment ahead and big plans to build networks, but you know networks aren't cheap, Ash. Um, so is it actually obviously the case that it's best to build the networks, um, or is it going to end up being um, cheaper to allow the curtailment? Yeah, maybe we can look at the cost of curtailment first. So in 2021, the cost of curtailment uh, due to network con- constraints and system stability reasons was about £1 billion, which grew to nearly £2 billion in 2022. Aurora's analysis on transmission network, sh- uh, network build-out shows that the additional cost of building all the network proposed in ASTI and HND that we discussed earlier could be offset by this cost savings in constraint management. More importantly, if we fail to deliver even some of ASTI, we found that the cumulative total system emissions from 2023 to 2050 are 316 megatons, whereas we could reduce them to 184 megatons by delivering both ASTI and HND. This is a 134 megaton reduction in emissions, which corresponds to 2.6 times the power sector emissions in 2022. Uh, to take a step even further behind, if we can't build enough networks, we will have built over 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, yet failed to decarbonize. This would be a very special achievement. Yeah, it would, Ash. Yeah, it, bring, it, it really brings it home, that, doesn't it? The, the, the cost side is um, definitely uh, one that sort of supports building more networks uh, and so on. But, you know, that carbon point's really crucial, isn't it? What's the, what's the point if you can't get the, the power to, to market? Now, other than obviously just building more networks and opening up the connections regime, which um, Julian was talking about, Julian Leslie was talking about on the podcasts um, in July, um, what, what else? What else could um, could help the system manage what is likely to be a transitional period of quite high constraints? We, we've talked about some of the assets we're working with at the moment, but what, what do you see as as the um, the points of hope, Ash? So we need to build nearly 10,000 kilometers of transmission lines over the next 10, 12 years in order to get where we want to be. This will be a hard problem for reasons we've seen. We need to get supply chain sorted out. We need to consider how to fix the planning system. It's just a really hard problem. So we need to consider complementary solutions as well. Long duration storage, which we talked about earlier, can help mitigate the need for some of the network capacity while also offering a range of system benefits. This technology, so this could be pumped storage, it could be uh, compressed air or liquid air storage, it currently lacks a route to market. Neither the CFD scheme nor the capacity market are suitable mechanisms to support it. A mechanism like the revenue cap and floor scheme, currently under consideration in Desnes' RIMA consultation, would be significantly more effective in de-risking investment in long duration storage at a low cost to consumers. Alternatively, we could consider hydrogen, the Crown Estate Scotland Scotland leasing round contracted over 12 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity in the very, very north of Scotland, bringing generation from these projects to where the demand is entails building transmission lines over the entire length across the country. One option uh, is to go for hydrogen instead, where uh, the government would need to provide low carbon hydrogen subsidies. So the, uh, a current consultation in, in uh, that's in uh, that's being considered is a low carbon hydrogen ar- uh, agreement where just like the CFD scheme, there's hydrogen offtake at a fixed price by the government. But this still has challenges. Unless there is offtake secured, it would be very difficult to raise debt for a hydrogen project. So we need a credit worthy offtaker for the hydrogen to be present in Scotland. So this is, a, a, again, a very difficult problem to solve. Both of these options, long duration storage and hydrogen, require material changes to the market design. We need new subsidy schemes. We potentially need locational pricing to support hydrogen production in Scotland. The government will have a significant role to play in enabling these. And we need to act now as both of these options also have significant lead times. I think to add to what uh, Ash was saying as well, um, there's also some other dimensions of it I've been mentioning, particularly for uh, the investors uh, and asset operators on the system, the interest is in the BM. But at the moment, the BM isn't necessarily that reflective of uh, the, the future electricity system that we're expecting to have. It's not necessarily 
well positioned uh, for batteries to actually participate in it or other assets to participate in it. So definitely there's an angle of BM reform, um, I think, which could also be taken into consideration as one of the other potential solutions. And lots of other innovative ideas, which is where it's been really interesting working with different types of assets and portfolio managers over time. There's some ideas being flown around, I think, as well, or being thrown around um, on uh, batteries with some talking about integrating batteries into the transmission network as well, similar to what is being done in other regions. Uh, such as virtual transmission in Australia or grid boosters in Germany, where uh, the batteries are actually being used rather than actually building additional transmission lines to sort of relieve constraints. That's brilliant. Thank you. Really interesting. I mean, I, I'm sort of left a little bit with the conclusion I often am when I'm talking about net zero on this podcast, which is it's you're, we're well beyond the either or stage of planning the energy transition. This is a very much an and and problem. So we need to be building the networks. We need to be thinking about the market arrangements. We need to be supporting hydrogen. We need to be supporting um, things like LDES that can alleviate the, the congestion. Um, but look, thank you very much, Ash, for talking through a lot of the research we're doing for our subscription clients and Alex for talking through the kinds of um, problems that um, our clients come to us with, either for our software solutions or for our advisory help. Uh, it's been really helpful. So Alex, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. And Ash, thanks very much for your insights. Yeah, pleasure to be here, Dan. Thank you. That was Dan Monzani, Aurora's Managing Director for UK and Ireland, talking to Ashutosh Padelka, who leads Aurora's Renewables Research in GB, and Alex Houston, who's a Senior Associate in Aurora's GB Advisory Team. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.